Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Um, this is going to be my series on just like solving questions together and um, using a variety of Q banks available for the USMLE and just like going through these questions, how to use the Q bank, and um, you know at the same time you guys are learning and I am uh, also studying. So uh, this is the only way for me to fit in room for this channel uh, in my current lifestyle. So uh, let's just get started and solve some of these questions. And um, right now I am currently on a neural block. I have my pen with me, my papers here. Uh, QBank is ready, it's time, so it is counting time. And if there's any kind of like bullet point or factoid or um, just any high yield fact, I'll just write it down and I compile them and then I'll put them together in another video for you guys. So let's just get started. A 55 year old man is brought to the emergency room because of fever and increased confusion for the past two days. Oh, and disclaimer, uh, I did not study neuro before this. And um, I mean, like I haven't read like the first aid section very thoroughly, and this is not at all sponsored by Amboss or anything like that. I'm just going through a, a QBank that I think is useful. Um, it's helped me get through a couple of uh, topics like GIT and respiratory and things like that. I used to just like read the section and then I would do 40 questions and then I would cry because my marks were like really bad, but then I'd read the section again, plus the notes that I took and then I'd do another 40 questions and then I would notice like an incremental like 10% increase in my, um, in how I'm doing. So that's been the method that I've been working on. For some reason I did it for neuro and I did like 40 questions and then 80 questions and then I would do the same method, like I would read and it would take like about three hours to get through the neuro first aid section and then I would read it and then I would do the questions and I would read it and I would do the questions and for like two or three times in a row I wasn't moving past 50 percent so um I mean that kind of was a little bit disheartening and very disappointing um because I'm like okay clearly I'm doing something wrong and it kind of just stagnated all of my study progress but you know this time I'll come back to neuro and I'm determined to uh overcome whatever is um this challenge and I know I'm using the same technique but I do think it was just a matter of like volume because there is a lot of stuff to get through with regards to neuro so uh, let's get started and answer these questions so a 55 year old man is brought to the emergency room because of fever and increased confusion over the past two days he has paranoid schizophrenia treated with chlor uh, chlorpromazine and again um, I'm not the best at pronouncing anything so I'm gonna say things wrong he appears diaphoretic Diaphoretic and his temperature is 40 degrees. Okay, respiration is 31, blood pressure 158, neurological exam shows psychomotor agitation and coherent speech. There is generalized muscle rigidity. Uh, deep tendon reflexes are decreased bilaterally. Sodium, a serum laboratory analysis shows leukocyte count of 11,000, serum creatinine kinase. A uh, concentration of 945. The most appropriate drug for this patient acts by inhibiting which of the following? Okay, interesting. So he is a paranoid schizophrenic, and he's having these symptoms. So, um, oh, it's, it's not highlighting? Okay, good, it's highlighting. So, um, again, like in my previous videos, I show you guys how to use this QBank, and just like any other QBank, like you can highlight, you can see labs, you can click attending tip, for example, if you don't know how to um, answer the question, it might give you a little hint to guide you to the correct answer. You can take notes, you can mark the question for later, um, all of these things. So it's pretty useful as a tool. Uh, anyway, so this patient is a paranoid schizophrenic, so he's on antipsychotic medication, and all I'm seeing right now is high blood pressure, increased respiratory rate, increased pulse, and he has fever. So I'm thinking of neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome. But I forgot the pathophysiology of neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So let's just cancel out the questions. Let's just do that. So it's not bacterial cell wall synthesis that's causing this. Uh, or sorry, the most appropriate drug isn't going to be dealing with an infection. We're not dealing with an infection here. Um, although his leukocyte count is 11,000. Mm. Okay. Beta adrenergic receptors, I don't know. I actually don't know. Okay. The most appropriate drug for this patient acts by inhibiting which of the following? Oh, sorry, yeah. I'm overthinking that. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome can be treated with, uh, I believe it's treated with xantrolene, just like um, just like the the other thing that happens with succinylcholine, uh, malignant hyperthermia. So I'm gonna go with this. Okay, good. I was overthinking the question a little bit. So. Um, Again, so dantrolene works by ryanodine, 
receptor on the sarcoplasm particular. So I'm just going to write that down. Um, first of all, let's just see what it says as the tip. The schizophrenic patient presents uh, with fever. So if I get a, uh, I'm just going to write a note here, a psychotic patient. Psychotic patient plus fever plus increased creatinine kinase um, plus increased heart rates increased respiratory rate all that stuff is neuroleptic malignant neuroleptic malignant syndrome uh, so NMS the initial treatment so the initial treatment by the way is like uh, like give fluids because you want to protect the kidneys from the rhabdomyolysis that's going on and then you give dantrolene. Dantrolene is a muscle reaxant, relaxant, so I'm going to write the treatment is dantrolene and it's a muscle relaxant and it works by blocking calcium uh, release by blocking the ryanodyne receptors on sarcoplasmic reticulum. After discontinuation of the offending drug, which was the chlorpromazine, dantrolene is indicated in the treatment of NMS because it decreases muscle rigidity, thereby the body temperature, as well as the risk of rhabdomyolysis. Although dantrolene is the most commonly given, alternative pharmacotherapy includes bromocryptine, amantadine, and possibly aflomorphine. Benzodiazepines are also used. Let's take a look at some of the other answers here. Postsynaptic D2 receptors and serotonin 2A receptors. That's clozapine is an atypical antipsychotic used in the treatment of refractory schizophrenia uh, that acts by postsynaptic blockade of D2 and inhibition of serotonin to an alpha adrenergic histamine receptor. So there's no evidence that this patient's schizophrenia was poorly controlled. Okay, choline esterase. Pisostigmine is a choline esterase inhibitor that decreases the total breakdown of acetylcholine, thereby increasing parasympathetic activity. But we don't have the signs of that. We don't have the dry skin, the diaphoresis um, that would have led to muscle rigidity. It doesn't match the, this, this patient's case. Is the drug that's treating him a histamine receptor or serotonin 2 receptor? And working on those receptors. Um, Cyproheptadine is a first generation H1 antihistamine that is indicated in the treatment of serotonin syndrome. So I'm just going to write that down because I haven't studied serotonin syndrome that well. So uh, serotonin syndrome. Uh, I'm going to say treatment is cyproheptadine. And in brackets, I'm just going to say it works on H1 receptors and serotonin two receptors so that's what's going to be in my bullet point for that this condition is similar presentation so yeah serotonin syndrome looks, is one of the differentials you would have for neuroleptic malignant syndrome but serotonin syndrome also tends to cause hyperreflexia and myoclonus vomiting and diarrhea in addition serotonin syndrome generally occurs in the context of polypharmacy with drugs that increase serotonin levels, none of which were taken by this patient, and that makes sense. Let's say I want to like review serotonin syndrome, right? I'll just click it, and immediately it will take me to the knowledge bank right away, so it's not going to take me out of the Q-bank, I'm still in the Q-bank, and then it'll just take me to the bullet, uh, or high yield bullet points regarding serotonin syndrome. So let's just say I want to review serotonin syndrome right now, and uh, let's see what it says, and I'll write down anything that I think is useful uh, to me. So serotonin syndrome description is life-threatening, so it's important to know what are like the life-threatening um, conditions. So serotonin syndrome is life-threatening psychiatric, uh, life-threatening psychiatric condition, as well as neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So it's life-threatening, and I'm putting that in uh, a bullet for me. And cause is ingestion of any drug that increases serotonin levels. So I'm looking at a lot of drugs, psychiatric drugs, um, SSRIs, other drugs, tramadol, um, MDMA, St. John's wort. Increased risk with concurrent use of two or more serotonergic drugs. So increased risk with two or more uh, drugs, serotonergic drugs, or switching without tapering. So I think that's important to know because it might be uh, that might be the case. Uh, the clinical vignette it might look like that. 
Clinical features is a triad of neuromuscular excitability plus autonomic dysfunctions and altered mental status. So neuromuscular excitability. I think that's the difference because neuroleptic malignant syndrome was defined more of like hypotonia. But this one would have hypertonia, uh, increased reflexes, all, all of the features of neuromuscular excitability. So neuromuscular excitability. Autonomic dysfunction. Plus altered mental status. By the way, like the time right now is 7 p.m. or oh, 6.52. Um, and maybe you get an idea of actually how long it takes to go through questions. And um, it does take definitely a lot of time. The idea of doing maybe 20 questions daily would take about two, three, four hours from you. Um, with some skill, you might be able to push the limit to 40 questions per day. Um, it definitely takes time, especially if you're new, but don't um, let that defeat you or depress you in any way. Um, I mean, we're all learning as we go, so that's fine. So what else are we looking at? Diaphoresis and hyperthermia, cardiovascular, hypertension, tachycardia, cool. Psychiatric uh, picture, delirium, psychomotor agitation, anxiety. Uh, neurological hypertonia, hyperreflexia, myoclonus. So that's, that's important. So I'm just going to put under neuromuscular excitability that there is myoclonus. Diagnosis is primarily based on patient history and clinical features, differential diagnosis. Uh, treatment, immediate discontinuation of the drugs, antihypertensives, fluid replacement, and then they also have here the cyproheptidine. So I'm just going to, again, write down cyproheptidine. Uh, and it works on what receptors? It says H1 and serotonin receptors and um, 1 and 2. So the uh, use for cases of serotonin syndrome that do not respond to supportive care, cooling measures, ice packs, and compresses. So serotonin syndrome causes harm, hyperthermia, autonomic instability, rise of blood pressure, and myoclonus. I really like that, so I'm just going to write that down. Harm, hyperthermia. A is autonomic instability. As you can tell already, it looks very similar to... Uh, Neuroleptic malignant syndrome so far. Uh, rise in blood pressure, that was also part of it. But the key feature or the key difference here is myoclonus. Increase uh, blood pressure and myoclonus. So, harm. I like that acronym. Um, again, they have drug induced uh, hyperthermia or malignant hyperthermia. I'm just going to put that in a little point as well so I can remember. Uh, Drug-induced hyperthermia or malignant hyperthermia is caused by succinylcholine to, uh, commonly. So malignant. Hyperthermia, uh, again, like the difference between them would be like very elevated levels of CK. As, uh, that would be you know, throughout the three cases, I think. Um, but I mean, this one you would have like a patient clearly on the table, on the operating table, and he's... Um, developing symptoms of malignant hyperthermia. So succinylcholine, I believe dantrolene works for um, both as well. So malignant hyperthermia, dantrolene is the treatment, um, as well as for neuroleptic malignant syndrome. And uh, cyproheptidine is what's used for serotonin syndrome. Um, again, like Ambos has really nice tables. For me personally, it's hard to get through them um, because they're just so bulky. Uh, that's just my personal opinion. Um, but they are definitely uh, pretty good. So let's close this here and let's move on to the next question. A 39-year-old man is brought to the physician by his wife because of personality changes over the past year. He has become increasingly irritable, loud, aggressive, and impulsive. His wife also reports jerky movements of uh, his limbs and trunk for the past few months. His father had dementia in his mid-40s, but the details are of his condition are unclear. The patient appears... Uh, restless. Examination shows irregular movements of the extremities and twitching of the face and tongue. Mental status is the examination shows impaired memory. This patient's condition is most likely associated with which of the following changes on MRI. So let's let's go in and highlight what we think are the, the words that will help us uh, get to the diagnosis of what he has, right? So I'm seeing personality changes. Um, loud, irritable, aggressive, impulsive. Uh, his wife also reports jerky movements of his limbs and trunks. His father had dementia uh, in his 40s. So 
she has um, irregular movements of the uh, face and tongue and impaired memory. Um, so I'm thinking she has, I mean, I could be wrong, I, but I'm thinking of uh, like Louis body dementia. So it's kind of like Parkinson's plus personality changes. So, um, I mean, it could be wrong, but I'm just going to go with that as my answer. So I'm going to pick degeneration of frontal and temporal lobes. Okay, so that's wrong. Oh, that's frontal temporal dementia. Gosh. <laughs> oh, he has Huntington's. Wow, I'm really dumb today. I say it's Huntington's. Why did I say Parkinson's? I always confuse the two, to be honest. The patient must uh, most likely has Huntington's disease in the presence of Korea. And behavioral changes. Why did I pick Parkinson? I was just saying, yes, his father. So, yes, he has anticipation because he's 39 and he's having symptoms. But, um, okay, so if it is uh, Huntington's, then. Mm, so, that would be the answer. Atrophy of the striatum, specifically the body nucleus and the putamen. I need to review Huntington's and Parkinson's because. I get those two confused all the time, but I'm not going to do that right now in front of you guys because um, that's going to take a long time. So uh, I will skip it and, and just remember uh, to definitely review those two topics uh, before I go on to any other questions tomorrow. And so let's write that down. So Huntington um, equals atrophy of the like I said, like I haven't actually read neuro properly, properly in a while, so um, you know mistakes are are gonna be a given at this point. But um, we're just gonna solve the questions and memorize points, and then go back and review so that we learn as we go, at least, and we're not intimidated by questions. That's the whole point of this. So Huntington, a uh, Huntington is atrophy of the striatum, specifically the caudate nucleus. And the putamen is a classic finding in patients with Huntington disease. It's caused by CAG tri uh, nucleotide repeat expansion. So, this disorder is diagnosed via genetic testing with neuroimaging used to rule out other intracranial pathologies. Why did I pick frontotemporal lobe <laughs> dementia? This patient's memory impairment and personality changes and hereditary component could all be attributed to FTC. However, the presence of Korea suggests a different diagnosis. Okay, so that makes sense. Uh, I'm not totally dumb, so, um, I mean, it still makes sense to have that as part of your differential, but, you know, what's wrong? Um, let's see. I'm not seeing tumor, because if he had an extra axial tumor, um, generally speaking, you would have things like seizures, um, and other symptoms and um, symptoms of increased intracranial pressure, things like that. Extra axial tumor with thorough attachment is a keyword for uh, meningioma. So I'm just going to write that down to remind me that. So meningioma equals uh, extra axial with dural attachment. Uh, and I believe it's referred to as like rat tail because you can actually see it um, like tapering at the end. So that's what it would look like. You can always click the picture and you can see the parasagittal meningioma. Uh, and here would be like the rat tail over here. Uh, that's your overlay. Well demarcated mass in the right parasagittal cortical uh, region. Let's take a look at periventricular plots. I think that was uh, multiple sclerosis. So periventricular plaques, I mean, the, the key part of it, doing questions in study mode is to learn as you go and not to be intimidated by getting wrong um, answers and to use the wrong answers as a way to figure out why it's wrong. And you're actually like learning, essentially what you're learning is not just like, okay, I figure out what the correct answer is, not just write that down or something. No, like you need to take advantage of the fact that you have five facts uh, that you can actually 
uh, learn and then you're actually learning five times what you would if you just left it at the correct answer and then move on. No, you want to look at the wrong answers, why they're wrong, what makes this different other than that, and that practice is going to help you. So periventricular uh, plaques on MRI uh, in combination with neurological dysfunction is diagnostic of multiple sclerosis. Which is a very late feature associated with cognitive impairment, including memory deficits and depression. Made a uh, majority of affected individuals have relapsing and remitting MS and experience alternating flare-ups with complete remission of symptoms rather than continuous progressive pattern treating this patient. So, it, like the key difference here is like this patient is having continuous deterioration of the symptoms, but in MS you would have an on and off type of history, and this patient has no history of symptoms that would suggest MS, such as impaired vision, diplopia, or sensory disturbances. Um, let's take a look at those periventricular plaques, so you can always uh, use um, you know, this extra information here. So. Let's see the overlay so we know what we're looking at exactly. Okay, so I could see the ventricles and there are plaques surrounding them. Again, when you look at the overlay. Um, so multiple sclerotic plaques in the periventricular white matter on T2 weighted images. That's like a buzzword for um, what you're looking at. So I'm just going to put that in the records on T2 weighted MRI. And I'm just going to put a small note to myself that this is a very late feature of MS. So demyelinated plaques in the periventricular matter in a patient with multiple sclerosis. The lateral ventricles are encircled, lesions um, are shown in green, so like we've seen in the overlay. Um, let's see, multiple cortical and subcortical infarctions. Um, so that would be vascular dementia, which would present in a stepwise deterioration of mental capacity, similar to what the patient is experiencing, but and it would be progressive. It could also explain his abnormal behavior, but it does not present with chorea. He does not have any significant atherosclerotic risk factors because he is a young man, uh, technically like 39. Wouldn't be expecting vascular dementia. Um, let's take a look at that as well. So subcortical atherosclerotic uh, encephalopathy, CT head without contrast, abnormal low attenuation areas. So where are we looking here? Okay. Uh, are seen in the periventricular white matter. Two frontal lacunar infarcts and the arrows here. Okay. Um, these findings may be seen in patients with clinically suspected subcortical atherosclerotic encephalopathy. So that's like, I really love this part about AMBOSS, is like they have the overlay, um, so you can clearly see what you're looking at. Um, next is reduced hippocampal volume, so I believe that that's Alzheimer's. I'll just write that down in case I am wrong. Decreased hippocampal volume. So, reduced hippocampal volume seen on MRI is seen in patients with Alzheimer's disease. Even though familial forms of AD can exist, early symptoms would include short term memory loss to depressed mood, not impulsive behavior. Furthermore, Alzheimer's would not account for the presence of chorea. So, let's take a look at the reduced hippocampal uh, volume loss. So where are we looking at? Okay, so these are also T2-weighted MRI images. Medial temporal lobe atrophy. So that's what we're looking at here. That's going to be in green and dilation of the uh, temporal horns of the lateral ventricles. So remember, you're going to have like atrophy of the brain or the cortex. You're going to have like a response to that is dilation of the uh, ventricles. Um, um, so that's what you see in red. Okay, let's move on to a new question. Okay. A 33 year old man comes to the ER because of dry mouth and blurred vision for the past 30 minutes. Prior to this, he was on a road trip and he felt nauseous, dizzy, and fatigued. So his friend gave him a drug test that helped in the uh, a drug that helped in the past. Physical exam shows dry mucous membranes and dilated pupils. The remainder of the exam shows no upper mouth. Administration of which of the following is most likely to cause a similar adverse reaction in this patient? Um, I'm just gonna guess you guys. I haven't studied pharma. Um, okay, so he likely received a scopolamine patch. 
So I know he's having um, anticholinergic effects. I always rush, like, when selecting answers, honestly. Like, something I do need to work on. Scopolamine, passion, emotion, sickness. Uh, and now he has dry mouth and blurred vision. Now, so I just can see he's having anticholinergic effects. Um, so, oh, oxygen. So I actually remembered from doing this question previously. So oxybutin will also have um, similar effects. It's a muscarinic antagonist and it treats overactive bladder incontinence. Like other muscarinic antagonists such as scopolamine, it has adverse anticholinergic effects such as dry mucous membranes and midriasis resulting from lack of specificity to its target tissue. Okay, toxicity with anticholinergic effects causing anticholinergic syndrome is treated with physostigmine. Okay, um, let's just go and let's move on. Um, a 46 year old man comes to the physician because of a two month history of hoarseness and drooling. Initially, he had difficulty swallowing solid food and now he has difficulty swallowing softer foods like oatmeal. During this period, he also developed weakness in both arms and has uh, some weight loss. Okay. His vital signs are within normal limits. His exam shows um, tongue atrophy and pooled oral secretions. There is a diffuse muscle atrophy in all extremities. Deep tendon reflexes are three plus. Sensation to pinprick, light touch, and vibration is intact. And an esophagogastrodontoscopy shows no abnormalities. Which of the following is the likely cause of the symptom? Okay, I'm gonna go with destruction of upper and lower motor neurons because this looks like ALS. Okay, so we answered it correctly. Um, this patient has progressive dysphagia and weakness and diffuse muscle atrophy and intact sensation. So the key thing with ALS is that there is intact sensation. Plus signs of upper motor neuron plus lower motor neuron lesions. So it's characteristic of ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is also called Lou Gehrig's disease. Upper motor neuron destruction manifests as hyperreflexia, increased muscle tone and spasticity, lower uh, LMN lesions show as the dysphagia and the muscle atrophy. Let's take a look at the other answers as well because we can learn from that. So multiple cerebral infarctions uh, is characteristic of embolic strokes and it would explain the upper motor symptoms. Um, however, strokes typically result in asymmetrical rather than bilateral weaknesses and they do not cause uh, lower motor neuron signs. Um, autoimmune destruction of acetylcholine receptors um, that's my senior gravis, where there is weakness at the end of the day. Although this patient has muscle weakness, he has signs of upper motor neuron involvement, hyperreflexia, which is not seen in my senior gravis. So in addition, there's more than 50% of patients with MG also have ocular symptoms, which are not found here. Demyelination of the peripheral nerves, so you're thinking of the amber so why is it not the amberine? Um, it's a ascending. So GPS is an ascending paralysis or ascending weakness plus bulbar signs. But it's faster, so it progresses over a few days. Whereas this patient's clinical vignette was over several months. GBS also causes hyporeflexia due to lower motor neuron demyelination, not hyperreflexia seen in this patient. So, sorry, hyporeflexia due to lower motor neuron lesion, which makes sense. Um, in addition, about two thirds of patients with GBS report on preceding upper respiratory gastrointestinal infection, which is ba which is absent here, uh, and that's very important in history. So, a history of a GI or respiratory infection. 
Okay. Uh, destruction of the central spinal canal. So you might think that syringomyelia is one of the causes of this patient's uh, symptoms. And that's a possible uh, differential, but let's see what the difference is. Um, the difference is dilation um, is a characteristic sign. Uh, dilation of the spinal cord is characteristic of syringomyelia, which is uh, progressive damage of the spinal thalamic tract. So you're going to have a patient who has lost their pain and temperature fibers and... Uh, you're going to have this, uh, what do they call it? They call it like a cape-like distribution of loss of pain and, sense, uh, and temperature sensation. And it's um, bilateral, so you might think this is the case again. But the main thing, I believe, with syringomyelia is the history. So you might want to look into a history of trauma, but there is no history of trauma here um, that this patient is complaining of that would have caused the syringomyelia. Um, so that's that. Like uh, another thing about Amboss is like they also provide like these uh, nice images that help you, um, you know, further cement your understanding of some of these topics. Okay, thanks. All right. Okay. Thanks. All right. Okay, so uh, next question. A 66-year-old man is brought to the emergency department uh, 30 minutes after his wife found him lying on his back on the ground next to a ladder. So he fell. She reports that he was unconscious when she found him, but he seemed confused and reported a headache. He has hypertension and atrial fibrillation. His med medications are methylcholol and rivaroxaban. On admission, he appears somnolent and is oriented only to a person. Okay, there's a large hematoma and swelling in the occiput. Supportive treatment is initiated. Non contrast CT shows a 3 centimeter intraparenchymal hyperdense lesion with surrounding hypodense area in the orbitofrontal lobe. Which of the following sequelae is most likely to develop in this patient? Let's see. Um, okay, so he has bleeding in his brain. And they're asking what is a possible complication of that? A possible complication of bleeding in the brain is due to calcium reaching the brain and causing vasoconstriction, which can cause a stroke. So I'm going to go with contralateral paralysis as my answer. Hmm. Although the point of impact is occipital in this patient, he has developed significant contracoup hemorrhage in his prefrontal cortex, likely worsened by the anticoagulation therapy. Uh, I'm surprised that I got this answer wrong. Contralateral paralysis can result from damage to the primary motor cortex. First of all, why did I pick contralateral paralysis? Motor deficit, like, I understood this question, like, he has bleeding uh, in his head, and one of the questions that you could be asked is, like, what's a possible sequelae of, you know, like, intraparenchymal bleeding in the brain? Uh, and one of them is that you can't get a stroke after it because the blood um, uh, will irritate the 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 brain and it will cause vasoconstriction due to the circulating calcium and you would get a stroke so um let's see i guess they want to know what's in the occipital frontal lobe that would happen third language comprehension impaired impulse control so frontal lobe like that would have um impulse control areas i think i'm really surprised that this is um I don't like this question. So I think that's fair to say that my reasoning wasn't totally wrong, but for some reason I'm not picking up that that's what they wanted. Which of the following sequelae is most likely to develop in this patient? I guess it's sequel, um, sequelae, but not complication. Like I'm reading it wrong. Like I'm overreading the question. So anyway, the prefrontal cortex. Cortex is responsible for higher cognitive function. 
function. So if you have a lesion in that, you will have personality changes and lots of inhibition and impulse control. Emotional ability and impaired judgment. Cerebral contusions are associated with severe intracranial complications and therefore require close observation for at least 24 hours. Given the size of the patient's contusion, which is more than one centimeter, and the presence of confusion, he will most likely require inpatient observation and further neurological evaluation. In patients with worsening symptoms, uh, decompressive craniotomy may be considered. So I'm just going to write a note here, a deep compressive craniotomy for um, brain contusions. Okay. Um, okay. Hmm. Not the best question, but okay. Let's take a look at it. CT head. Brain window left. The contusion is visible. Okay, so I've seen the contusion over here. Um, surrounded by edema, hypodense white lip. Okay. Um, bone window on the right. So I'm seeing a fracture here where the red is, right? So that's the fracture, and then uh, you have the counter coup hemorrhage over here. Um, okay. Counter coup injury where the impact of the external force at the back of the head resulted in cerebral contusion of the frontal lobe. All right, well, we learned something here. So, counter coup injury. Next. A 60 year old man with a one year history of recurrent aspiration pneumonia is brought to the emergency department by his daughter after he was found unconscious and gasping for air in his bed. Despite resuscitative efforts, the patient dies. Autopsy shows degeneration of the cortical spinal tract and interior horn cells in the upper cervical cord. There is asymmetrical atrophy of the limb muscles, diaphragm and intercostal muscles, which the following drugs would have most likely uh, slowed the progression of uh, this patient. Okay. Yeah. Asymmetrical atrophy of the muscles, the diaphragm and intercostal muscles. Um, I, I don't want to say it's ALS, but like right now, that's the only thing in my head because of the previous question. Uh, let's take this moment to get an extra hint on how to answer the question, because if it is ALS and the answer would be real as all, um, I'm just not confident based on the clinical picture entirely for something that. So yeah, it is ALS. So autopsy is uh, damage to the cortical spinal tract and lower motor neuron. Degeneration okay, indicates ALS. Degeneration of the cortical spinal tract and anterior horn cells of the upper cervical cord. So it is ALS. So the treatment would be your ALS. ALS. So uh, treatment, what would have slowed it down is Rylozole. I'm not sure again how to pronounce everything here. So it works by blocking sodium channels. Uh, Rylozole exerts an anti excitotoxic effect by inhibition of glutamate. So it blocks sodium channels. It also blocks glutamate. In patients with ALS, it slows on deterioration of motor function and thus it increases life expectancy. ALS usually manifests in patients um, older than 50 years of age with combined upper and motor, uh, lower motor neuron lesions. Symptoms of bulbar palsy, so that's what we're seeing in this patient. Late symptoms include cognitive impairment as well as life-threatening respiratory failure due to paralysis of respiratory muscles and aspiration pneumonia due to the bulbar weakness. Um, I want to take this moment and just review ALS. So let's just review ALS. 
I need trophic lateral sclerosis. Let's take a look and see what uh, what we can learn right now. So let's see the summary. Uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, formerly known as Lou Gehrig's disease, is a neurodegenerative disease with upper motor neuron uh, lesions. So let's see its epidemiology. It affects males more than females. The mean age of onset is a patient 65 years of age. Again, I'm just writing anything that I think is um, important for me to know. Familial history of ALS in 5 to 10 uh, percent of cases, with 90 to 95 percent being sporadic. Etiology, so what's causing ALS? I believe, I remember, okay, wow, that's a lot of stuff. So the genetics, so let's write this down because this could be like, um, you know, a, a possible question. So I'm just going to write down, I do remember reading about this, like superoxide dismutase. Um, there's a mutation on that and they need um, familial, familial forms. So yeah, the familial forms, uh, so in case you might get asked a question like if it's a familial case, like what's the uh, pathophysiology that needs superoxide dismutase uh, mutation. So I'm just going to write SOD1, so superoxide dismutase mutation. And I'm just going to put in brackets the words familial cases of ALS. So TARD BP, I'm just going to write others include TARD uh, BP, C9ORS72, and FUS. Cool. Environmental risk factors include exposure to pesticides, lead, whatever this is. What is that? So let's hover over it. It is a substance produced by cyanobacteria. The suggested ca uh, cause of combination of ALS, Parkinsonism, and dementia among Camoro individuals. Okay. Pathophysiology. Classically, the entire motor neuron system at two or more levels, upper and lower motor de uh, degeneration. So, uh, UMNL and LMNL. Um, cool. Clinical features. So, uh, asymmetric weakness. Okay. I always keep forgetting this, so let's just write this down. Asymmetric limb weakness, bulbar symptoms. Okay. Dysphagia. Yeah. Respiratory failure. Diagnostics. How do I diagnose ALS? So physical examination. Check the reflexes. Electromyography. Nerve conduction studies. Increased creatinine kinase. Bedside swallowing tests. Okay, so it doesn't seem to me like there's um, anything specific for ALS. Okay, so pathology. Differential diagnosis, treatment. Treatment, we said, was the riluzole, which is a glutamate antagonist. Prolonged survival of ALS on average for three months. Another thing called a barabone, I've not heard of that, so let's just write that down. Darabone, and it's a free radical scavenger. Rilazole really helps in treating Lou Gehrig's disease. So really, Rilazole, Rilazole, Lou Gehrig. So the word Lou Gehrig, Rilazole, that's one way to remember it. So that's pretty cool. Um, Let's see what the other answers were. Inactivated virus vaccine, so polio. Um, but this patient is not polio. You would suspect polio in a patient who, um, like, polio is extremely rare because it's been eradicated in the US and most countries. So I'd expect it in an immigrant child, uh, non vaccinated. Um, corticosteroids. Um, 
are used to treat chronic inflammatory diseases. Symptoms would include cutaneous findings. Um, let's see. Oh, okay, so they were talking about the esophageal hypomotility. But this patient's um, uh, examination didn't reveal uh, anything. So it said over here, I think, we're still on the same question. Or, oh, that was the previous question. Um, okay. What is this? Okay, I've never heard of this medication, so I'm just going to write down a little note on it. Glycerium or acetate. Okay, it's used in the treatment of multiple sclerosis. I've never heard of this so far in my studies. So, demyelinating disease that can cause upper motor neuron. Okay, however, autopsy would have shown focal demyelination and loss of axons and atrophy of the oligodendrocyte. So, uh, it's not MS at all. What is that? <laughs> Lucinersen. Used to treat spinal muscular atrophy. Okay, we uh, don't want to fill up our brains with too much uh, information that we uh, that's gonna crowd out the actual vital information. So let's skip. Um, a 62-year-old man is brought to the emergency department by his wife because she thinks he's having a stroke. He has hypertension and type two type two diabetes. He takes enalapril and metformin. He has smoked one pack of cigarettes per day for the past 35 years. His blood pressure is 162. CT uh, brain shows lacunar stroke. So, lacunar stroke, his blood pressure is very high. The patient most likely presents with each of the following findings on physical exam. Sorry, the brain shows lacunar stroke involving the left subthalamic nucleus. Okay. Why am I having trouble with this question? It's not truncal ataxia because that would be cerebellum. Is it dystonia? Let's just take that something sip. This patient's wife could have been injured if she had been standing nearby when this patient was having the stroke. Well, that makes me think it's Tina the Lismans. Okay, well, that was nice that the attending tip actually worked. So, contralateral hemibolismus. Can be seen in lacuna or infarct. Oh, the sub thalamic. Nucleus. They are caused by a reduction in activity in the indirect pathway of the basal ganglia. The coonar infarcts are non cortical infarcts characterized by absence of cortical sign. Subthalamic strokes are usually ischemic in etiology, and uncontrolled hypertension and diabetes are a significant uh, risk factor. Okay. Okay. No, stop. Oh my God. Sorry for that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They, like some people bring their dogs into restaurants and stuff. Uh, I just didn't want it to be licking my bag, which is on my chair. Anyway, so um, okay, so we got the answer correct using that tending tip, so that's nice. So, um, dystonia was something I was gonna pick. Dystonia can be seen secondary to lesions of the thalamus. Uh, a lacunar stroke with subthalamic nucleus is unlikely to present with dystonia. Okay. 
Cogwheel rigidity is typically seen in Parkinson's disease. Vertical gaze palsy. Uh, what was I gonna pick before I got the tip? Um, cogwheel rigidity, the Sonia. I think like I, I, I needed the two because I wasn't able to pick anything um, specifically because I'm used to seeing a lacunar stroke and the, the clinical vignette matches up with something going on with the uh, internal capsule. So, I mean, this is uh, new. Okay, let's move on. A 24-year-old man is brought to the ER because of violent jerky movements in his arms and legs that began 30 minutes ago. His father reports that the patient has a history of epilepsy. He is not responsive. I hate, hate epileptic drug questions. Physical exam shows alternating tonic jerks and chronic episodes. There is blood in the mouth. Administration of IV lorazepam is begun. Uh, in addition, treatment with a second drug is started uh, that alters the flow of sodium ions across the neural, neuronal membrane. The second agent administered is most likely which of the following drugs. Sorry, let's read this carefully again. 24 year old man, so he has epilepsy. And. Um, we gave him lorazepam plus a second drug. I would think that this second drug is given to prevent the reoccurrence, so I believe that's possible time. So, um, phenytoin uh, is given to prevent the reoccurrence. Again, sorry for the distraction. I just don't understand what's happening around me. <laughs> Somebody walked in to Starbucks with their dog, and all of the baristas came out to pet the dog, and the dog is like licking my bag over there. And then they just go back and they do their work, and she was so like. Hygiene is just not there. Uh, the recurrence of seizure. It's literally looking every single one of the um, the cups that they have. It's a cute dog. But it's, uh, I think it's because I just studied like uh, micro a couple days ago. <laughs> All I'm thinking about is disease. Okay, so phosphenatoin blocks the recurrence of seizure, so we gave um, lorazepam and then we gave phosphenatoin. Uh, blocks the recurrence of seizures, and it is a pre-drug thingy, right? So it's uh, converted to phenytoin, um, which is the active form of the drug by hydrolyzation. Once it's activated, it reduces the influx and increases the efflux of sodium. Um, so I'm just saying you're getting high uh, hypoporalizing, hypoporalizing. I can't even speak anymore. It is indicated for the prevention of seizure recurrence and status epileptic. So, uh, so it decreases influx and increases efflux of sodium. And I'm just gonna put in brackets that it is a pre. Or a pro drug, is it called pro or free drug? I forgot. Um, again, I, I don't want to overwhelm myself with too much details because uh, uh, I might like pick like the second, like look at the percentages here. I think these are like uh, the percentage of people who answer and pick this type of uh, answer. So I'm gonna, I tend to only stick to like maybe two or three of them. Um, that I'm reviewing, so I don't generally do all five, but you could if you wanted to. So let's just take a look at carbamazepine. It's an anti epileptic drug that inhibits voltage gated sodium channels in the brain as well. So it is used in the treatment of partial seizures, um, but it's not indicated for the treatment of status epilepticus. Okay. And let's take a look at the one where 11% of people answered this. So it also inhibits sodium calcium uh, sodium channels and glutamate release in the brain. Um, again, it's not used in the treatment of status epilepticus. 
Next question. Okay, we are on question number 40, which means that for today I did my goal of 40 questions, guys. It, this is actually insane. <laughs> I'm so tired. A previously healthy 50-year-old woman is brought to the emergency department 30 minutes after she was observed having a seizure. On arrival, she's conscious and reports she feels drowsy. An MRI of the brain shows a 4-centimeter round, sharply demarcated mass. She undergoes her section of the mass, and photomicrograph is shown. Okay, what are we looking at here? Um, the mass is derived from which of the following? Okay, okay, so what are we looking at? I think those are like the, the world's thing, right? Um, I hope you guys are actually enjoying the process of answering questions. It's not as elegant or sophisticated as um, you might think it is. All I remember, purple world cells thingy. I think that this is a schwannoma. Typically schwannoma. Localizes in the... The dog is staring me down, guys. <laughs> He's ready to bounce at any moment. Schwannoma. Um, I think it localizes in the... I feel like I've, all the tumors have collectively fused into one tumor and all the pathologists have collectively fused into one image so let's, let's just try to think schwannoma that was the thing that localizes in the that angle with the vestibular cochlear nerve okay so but i don't see her symptoms as having schwannoma maybe it's a meningioma and these are arachnoid cells this doesn't look like the This is not the mm. Weird. I'm probably overthinking this, but uh, if it's Schwann cells, I'm gonna I'm gonna end the video. <laughs> if it was Schwann cells, I answered it wrong. Okay, God. Okay, so these are arachnoid cells. Okay. Um. Okay, arachnoid cells. Uh, because we're dealing with a meningioma. Um, so these are benign tumors that manifest as a slow, sharply demarcated mass, spindle cells in a world pattern. So arachnoid cells, uh, meningioma, world pattern, and they cause compression of adjacent structures, contralateral plastic paresis due to compression of the motor cortex. Thank goodness we answered it correctly. So, photomicrograph showing the worlds of densely packed multiple areas of lamellated calcifications that are known as somoma bodies. Yes, let's remember that word, somoma bodies. Okay. Um, numerous ovoid structures of different sizes, basophilic center with the surrounding concentric acidophilic lamellae. Okay. Okay, world, meningioma. That's what it looks like, okay. Uh, <laughs> this is how it looks like when you're studying. It's not sophisticated at all. Um, okay, okay, meningioma. Hmm. Let's take a look at the Schwann, because I think it's also... Okay, it's not so cool. So, but it was right, like, I was like, nah, that's not Schwann no more. Localizes at the cerebellum pontine angle. Um, okay. What was the attending tip saying? The attending tip says uh, worlds of densely packed, multiple areas of calcifications, known as some of the bodies. Yeah. So if it was blood vessels, it would be hemangioma, right? Or hemangioblastoma. Astrocytes is uh, glioblastoma multiform. And uh, oligodendrocytes would be oligodendroglioma. Fried egg appearance. Here's your fried eggs. I don't know who said this was like fried eggs. Um, okay. Okay. So um, let's take a look at my progress for today. I do have the entire 257 questions, which are um, for like the neural. So I set up this Q bank with. Um, questions that are ranging from two star to five star in difficulty. Um, so that's a total of 257 questions. I started this one on the 19th, so 
Um, today I managed to do 40 questions, so I guess that's an accomplishment, something to be proud of. Uh, I really don't care about what I got right or wrong at this point. Um, it's just a matter of getting through questions. So thank God we managed to do that today. And um, let's just take a look at our analysis very briefly so far. Um, so let's take a look at the analysis so far. I'm kind of just like looking at this bar down here where it says narrow custom session, and it looks like, um, and it looks like I'm about at like 50 percent ish. So let's take a look at analysis. Okay, okay, we're at 50 percent so far. That's our um, progress. I mean, that's better than 50 percent that I was at. Um, the last three times I did a neural block, um, I'm averaging about two minutes per question, obviously, or three minutes, oh, like two minutes and 37 seconds. So that's obviously a bit too long. Um, but um, I guess because like I'm reading the question over and I'm talking uh, with you guys about them uh, in my head, obviously, I'd be solving them much faster. Um, but yeah, I mean, like just going through the questions, uh, purely just reading and stuff like that. Um, not even writing because it stops counting once you select an answer. Just going through 40 questions alone took about took about an hour and 45 minutes for me. So I mean that's just like clicking and then reading, not even reading. That's just getting to an answer. Um, so I mean it does take time to just solve the questions and then you have to factor in the fact that you have to add pretty much twice the amount of time as well to write down any notes and review the rest of the wrong answers and things like that. So. I mean, to make the most out of it. So you would need at least minimum three hours. You would need at least three or four hours to um, thoroughly go over everything. Um, I mean, I'm happy. I hope I can keep up this momentum of 58%. Like, I wouldn't be upset with that uh, for Neuro. Um, I might cheat tomorrow and go through the... Uh, first aid section um, with the stuff that I've learned so far and then that might up my average a little bit but um, or I can just start a totally new uh, Q bank and then I can show you guys actually like the progress so I did 40 today and say like today's 40 58 uh, percent so tomorrow I think what I'll do is I'll actually show you guys that this method works this is like the method that works for me um, so what I'll do it tonight is that I will um, read over first aid it takes about three hours to do the neuro section because it's the biggest one. I'll read over first aid as uh, fast as I can, skim read it, and then tomorrow I'll do 40 questions. And hopefully um, this doesn't backfire on me, then I should be able to score um, more than the 58%. So I'm just going to write that down. And then I got 58%. Tomorrow I will do what I just said, and I will see you guys tomorrow with 40 new questions and I'll sit down and solve the whole thing together. And um, uh, hopefully it works and I improve. Uh, and I can probably get through neuro in that way. So, um, yes, I'm hopeful. So we're not going to give up on neuro. It has defeated me, but I'm back and I'm ready. So um, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you learned how to use the Amboss uh, QBank. Like I said, I'm not sponsored by them in any way. It's just something that helped me. And um, I mean, it helped me get through first aid. And I wanted an alternative to UWorld, which people know is, can, can be very expensive. I believe Amboss is more affordable. And if you are Egyptian, I think you can email them directly and ask them for a discount that they usually have for people. Like you can talk to them about their um, help or sponsorship like that. So uh, that is something you could do because I don't want to jump headfirst into UWorld, which is so expensive. It can be around like $400 or $600. Um, I don't want to pay for a QBank and then realize like I'm overwhelmed by it. And like I said, like doing questions is overwhelming. It's something that you have to do um, over time to build your confidence and your confidence is going to go up and down because as soon as you start a new topic, you're going to be like, okay, I'm doing questions and I'm not improving and it's just up and, it's an up and down um, experience. So again, like I am using an alternative um, QBank, one that most people don't really know about or they don't use it. Um, but I'm again, like I'm comfortable this way because I want to use something, um, you know, that's cheaper, that's still good with its questions, I think. Um, and it's showing me some progress, some level of improvement. And um, at the same time, like not waste UWorld as a resource. I want to use that once I'm done, at least going through first aid once. And hopefully I can take you guys along with me on this journey. I hope to finish the first aid book entirely. And then when I'm done, I'll sit down and I'll do like a self-assessment to show you guys where I'm at with the method I was studying with. And then hopefully, inshallah, things will pan out into a plan uh, that I can actually follow. So uh, if you like this video, um, 
please share it with people who you think will benefit from um, my experience here. And um, I will see you guys in the next video. Take care.